Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, hi. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, so I'm going to talk about reinventing gaming. Uh, but first, I want to talk about this bumper sticker. This is a bumper sticker that I saw recently. And uh, it says, don't believe everything you think. And this is an idea that has a lot of appeal for me. This is something I think about a lot. We all have our own beliefs and thoughts and opinions. And we all tend to overestimate the likelihood that they're true. Um, I mean, this has to be true, right? When you look around at other people, right? So many people, so many different conflicting opinions. And not just about matters of taste, but really about matters of fact, about which policies will lead to which outcomes. And uh, you know, what is the most accurate way to describe the world, right? So you know, all of these different conflicting opinions can't be correct, right? And, and yet we all are so utterly convinced that our ideas and beliefs are correct. So it's easy to see when you look around at other people that you know, something doesn't add up. Um, and yet it's not so easy when we look at ourselves, right? And, and yet it's also obviously true that this has to be true of ourselves. Um, what are the chances that, that all the stars aligned perfectly in order to make our beliefs and our opinions correspond to reality in some extraordinarily high degree? It's just not very likely. But it seems likely, right? That seems like it, from inside here, that's exactly what feels like it happened, right? All the stars aligned, and I'm kind of at the center of the universe, and, and, and my view uh, is, is pretty much 100% accurate. Um, and, and you know, this is, a, this is just the way the human brain works, I think. This is just, you know, we cannot help but be uncritical cheerleaders for our own beliefs. And, um, and I think, like, what if this wasn't the way the world worked, right? What if we, what if we cared about truth enough to be a little bit like Copernicus and, uh, and suffer the humility of not being at the center of the universe for just a little bit in order to get a better view of the universe. So I'm not, I'm not talking about rejecting our own beliefs or not believing anything. I'm talking about the idea that we understand that our different beliefs and ideas all have a kind of likelihood of being true and that normally that likelihood is not 100%. And if we could get a good sense of what that likelihood was for our different beliefs, then we would be kind of smarter. Uh, this, is a, this is an idea that was discussed a while ago by a couple of guys, uh, Will Wilkinson and Tyler Cowen. Uh, Tyler Cowen, super interesting, super smart guy. He's an economist. Um, he did uh, his own TEDx talk recently on stories. And um, I think he's just a super, super interesting person. Um, and in this conversation, he talked about people and their un willingness or their inability to assign probabilities to their beliefs. Um, so here's what he said. He said, um, take whatever your political beliefs happen to be. Obviously, the view you hold you think is most likely to be true. But I think you should give that something like 60-40, whereas in reality, most people give, give it like 95 to 5 or 99 to 1 in terms of probability that it is correct. Or if you ask people, what is the chance this view of yours is wrong, very few people are willing to assign it any number at all. So this is a this is a pretty cool idea. I mean, we, we like this, right? And we would like this if other people did it, right? I mean, that would be, that would be pretty cool. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a powerful idea, and it's powerfully strange. Um, how different would the world be if, when we talked to other people and argued with other people and engaged in the process of trying to persuade people and being persuaded ourselves, if we kept a sense of the limits of our own knowledge? And, and we, we had a sense of, of the, the distortions and the, and the biases that we all carry around with us, and, and the, the, the partial and imperfect information that, that basically produces our beliefs. Not so that we can throw our hands up and say, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I can't know anything. But precisely because it is possible to know things. Right? We, we, we can improve the accuracy of, of our beliefs. I mean, we do think that there is a world out there and that we can learn about it and understand it. And, and in fact, that's one of the main reasons why we argue with other people and talk to other people and engage in the process of persuading and being persuaded. So uh, let me give you an example. I am not 100% sure that this idea, the one that I'm describing right now, is correct. I mean, maybe, 
maybe it's better if we all have a threshold of belief and it's pretty low, and beyond that threshold, we just act as if we are 100% certain. I mean, maybe it's better off overall if we are just the passionate and 100% confident advocates of our own beliefs. And then we let the overall process of, of disputation and debate and argumentation out in the world uh, sort things out, as opposed to trying to incorporate some of that process into our own thinking. I mean, this might be true, but it might not. You know, it might be better if we were all more rational about our own beliefs, if we had the ability to, to think about the levels of confidence that we have in our own beliefs. And, the, and, and, and we would think honestly about the fact that we might be wrong and what kinds of evidence would persuade us to change our minds. Uh, this cognitive ability, if we had it, this way of thinking, if it were widespread, it might make the world a better place. It might lead to better solutions faster to big problems. It might uh, help resolve conflicts uh, sooner or prevent them from happening at all. It, it, it might just improve our understanding of ourselves and the universe. And, and, uh, and, and, and it might be part of this long-term process of us evolving and, and improving as thinking, problem-solving, cognitive creatures. So how did I get here? Listening to this conversation and thinking about this issue and trying to incorporate it into my own thoughts. I got here through a game, the game of poker. So I first got interested in poker um, a while ago uh, when I was uh, watching a, a friend of mine, a programmer named Greg Ecker, and uh, he was playing a game of poker online, and um, he gets to the river, he gets to the last card, and his opponent uh, bets, and uh, Greg calls. And uh, then his opponent uh, flips over his hand, and uh, my friend has lost. And he says, uh, he says, well, that's okay. I win there most of the time. So that's a profitable play for me. And I said, what? Huh? What is that? Wait a minute. You didn't win? That's not a profit. You lost money on that play, right? What do you mean you win there most of the time? Either you win or you lose, and you lost. So that, what does it mean to be right most? Either you're right or you're wrong, and you were wrong, so what are you saying that you were right? Like, it really kind of like, like I didn't understand it, but in a kind of wonderful way. That got me very excited. And um, really, what he meant was that given everything that had happened, you know, in the hand up to that point, his opponent could have any number of a, of a different... Uh, different types of hands, and each one of them was more or less likely. And given the probabilities of all those different hands his opponent could have, and the amount of money that was in the pot, his call made sense and made him money, not right there, but in the long run. And it turns out that poker is filled with this kind of mysterious situation, this kind of weird situation where you're uncertain uh, but you can develop a pretty good sense of how uncertain you are. So you're, you're, you're ignorant about exactly what's going on, but you have a good sense of your ignorance. And in fact, if you want to learn poker and get good at poker, you have to develop this skill, this way of thinking about the limits of your own knowledge. And you have to develop the ability to think about your beliefs and estimate how likely they are to be true. So when you study poker seriously, you learn about this concept called expected value. And um, the idea of expected value is that the real way to, to evaluate the, uh, you know, to, to judge the value of your decisions is not to look at the outcome of a, of a specific event, but to look at all the particular, all the, all the possible outcomes uh, across all of the different, uh, uh, all the different possibilities in the long run, right? So that um, this concept, you know, I expected value means, you know, don't just think about the moment, but think about all the possible worlds and all the ways that things could be, and then make your decision based on, you know, what makes sense across all those different possibilities. And it's kind of a mind-blowing concept, expected value. Like, once you start to wrap your head around it, it, it's a very strange way to see the world, right? Not as these uh, kind of concrete, uh, very discrete, very specific, particular things, but almost like seeing the world as a set of probability clouds. So you start to think about not just what happened in any given moment, but what might have happened, you know, and, and how possible was this outcome or that outcome. You start to think not about um, whether you got a parking ticket or not, but how likely you were to get a parking ticket and how much that parking ticket would have been for 
And then you multiply those things together, and you decide, well, was that smart you know, to park there or not? Um, it's not really the way that our brains were designed to work. But you can sort of sense the power of it. You know, you can feel this way of seeing the world. Uh, it kind of makes you just a little bit smarter. It makes your decisions just a little bit better. And it took me years of dedicated play and serious study to begin to get a glimpse of what it means to see the world in this way. And poker, uh, because it's so deep and so simple and so widespread, you know, it has a lot of opportunities to study and learn. You discover that there's a, there's a lot of literature there's a lot of theoretical and uh, analytical uh, discussion and analysis that you can learn from. And there's a lot of software tools that uh, enable you to record and analyze your play and to get a sense of your decision making, to get a sense of your own thinking from the outside. Right? You can use these statistical tools to, uh, to kind of improve and study and get better at poker. And poker demands that you study and improve in order to get good at it. Um, it demands that you wrap your head around this, this unfamiliar way of thinking. And a kind of surprising thing about uh, poker for me is that in addition to this probabilistic, mathematical, analytical way of thinking, poker also demands an intense kind of empathy. Because in order to do well at poker, you need to understand your opponents. You need to empathize with them. You need to put yourself in their shoes and see the game from their perspective. And another thing that happens when you study poker and try to get good at it is that you start paying attention to your own emotions. You become aware of your emotions. You start realizing how often negative emotions distort your view of the world and make your decisions poor. And you start to try to develop the skill to overcome this, to, to master your emotions and kind of get, get better at recognizing them and paying attention to them and controlling them. And if you're serious about learning poker, you will have lots of opportunities to attempt to master negative emotions. Because you will experience terrible, terrible stretches of bad luck that go on for much longer than you thought was possible. You will encounter the, the deadliest black swans that you can ever imagine. And you will, you will be at your lowest point. And when you're at your lowest point, the indifferent hand of randomness will reach into your chest and pluck your heart and just beat you to death with it. <laughs> and you will, um, you'll ask yourself, is this bad luck? Is this bad play? Because it's really hard to tell the difference in poker. It, it's, uh, you know, uh, unlike the games of tennis and chess and Street Fighter, where you are punished for bad plays right away, in poker you can make a bad play and be rewarded. And you, make, you can make a good play and be punished. So it's pretty sick, this process of, of like, you know, the kind of not knowing where you are. And it forces you, you know, to, to really uh, to think beyond the sort of local moment and the particular, uh, the particular situation. Because if you make good plays consistently, you will win, but in the long run. And you discover, through this process, you discover that your ego, which can be this tremendous source of power, and confidence and motivation, your ego can kind of get in the way of studying and learning. Because when you're at the bottom of this cliff, your ego just wants to choke on its own anger and sorrow and bile and just feel sorry for itself and be resentful. What you discover that you need is a different kind of confidence, right? a kind of confidence that knows that some of your ideas are right and some of your ideas are wrong and you can't believe everything you think. That you need to, if you want to climb out of that, uh, of, of that chasm, you need to do some self-overcoming. You need to be able to think outside of yourself, to step outside of yourself and look at your own ideas, look at your strategies, which are really beliefs about the correct move in different situations, and analyze them and realize that they're not perfect and that they can be improved. And maybe, if you're lucky, you'll climb out of the other side of this experience with the ability to think past your ego. Your, to think beyond your, your limited perspective that we all have, that we're all familiar with, of being the center of our own universe. So I know it may sound a little bit silly, but if you get really serious about it, poker can be a kind of martial art. 
and a, and, a, and a sort of a spiritual discipline. And in this martial art, the exercises you do involve thinking about thinking, Become a, be, becoming aware of our own cognitive processes so that we can evolve them. Um, this guy, John von Neumann, did a lot of thinking about thinking. So he was an important scientific figure in the 20th century. He contributed a lot to, uh, to mathematics and physics and economics and, uh, and computer science. And he was fascinated by poker. And he studied poker as a way of thinking about how people who are in positions of conflict, uh, how they make decisions. And to understand this, not just from a psychological perspective, but from a computational perspective. And in studying poker, he developed uh, game theory, which has really totally changed our way of looking at economics and politics and war, and including uh, the concept of mutual assured destruction, which during the Cold War maybe brought us to the brink of thermonuclear destruction of the Earth. Or maybe, just maybe, prevented thermonuclear destruction of the Earth. So poker might have almost destroyed the world. And maybe poker saved the world. But in either case, poker changed my view of the world. It changed the way that I look at the world. And it, it, it introduced me to a new set of ideas, a new way of thinking about the world, a new way of thinking about thinking. It's one of the reasons that I got interested in, in decision making and economics and started paying attention to, to guys like Tyler Cowen and thinking about probability and math and, and things like that. Now, games are at a really interesting spot right now because we are starting to treat them seriously as culture for the first time not just as entertainment and recreation, but as something that can be really meaningful, can contribute to our lives, something of great value, that can reveal deep truths about ourselves and the universe. And when we talk about how a game can be meaningful, can contribute something profound to our lives, we, you know, we, we tend to focus on games like this, you know, games that have a lot of pictures and words and stories and characters and games that are rich, complicated simulations. And we tend to focus on how the game works as a metaphor, as a representation, as a message. We tend to talk a lot about games as simulated situations or carefully crafted experience, you know, where we're taken on a ride and we're made to feel all kinds of different emotions. And that's great. I'm super into that stuff. I mean, I'm, I'm enthusiastic about it. I love games that have rich, representational layers and, and characters and themes. I like games that are fascinating, beautiful worlds to explore and carefully crafted rides and simulations. But I, I just want to remind us that there are other ways to think about how games can produce deep, profound meanings, ways that are nothing like literature and film and theater. Games can be a kind of folk philosophy, uh, a, a, kind of, uh, uh, a kind of homebrew neuroscience, uh, a martial art in which you get to eat pretzels and drink beer, a, uh, a spiritual discipline made out of math, a way of thinking about thinking, a way of becoming more consciously aware of our thoughts and beliefs and decisions and learning about complex and counterintuitive truths about ourselves and the universe. So as we reinvent gaming as the dominant art form of the 21st century, I just want to remember that games can do that. Thank you.